Alright, so I want to go over some of these comments here. Um, so I saw this one and I want to talk about Robo. It says, I reckon Satan was bound to the Roman and Holy Roman Empire, the bottomless pit. And Satan being released from Vatican was all the harlot daughter denominations that came out of her. And all these denominations have surrounded the true camp body of Christ with their false doctrines trying to make or trying to take the mountain of God so I, I, I agree with the idea of what you're talking about here um, you know I would scratch the bottomless pit that and Satan being released I would scratch that part because it's it makes it too confusing but to your point um, the the Roman Empire is the fourth beast of Daniel and is the beast of Revelation so if we go here to uh, chapter 17 the great whore that sits upon many waters is the Roman Catholic Church and we go here and it says the waters which thou sawest where the whore sits are the peoples multitudes nations and tongues and we see that today very clearly that the Roman Catholic Church is in every country among every people and among every language of the world they are far and away the most the largest religion of the world okay and it's important to know that uh, well, let's go. First of all, let's go. It's important to know that uh, right here. So, the fourth beast of Daniel is also the beast of Revelation. All right, so let's make this clear. Okay. So that we can understand very simply, go to Revel or Daniel 7, verse 17. These great beasts which are four or four kings which shall arise out of the earth all right and so Daniel mentions the first three beasts Babylon the Medes and Persians and Greek Empire he doesn't mention the fourth beast but we can know who the fourth beast is by reading the new the New Testament and seeing that Caesar Augustus had controlled the entire world and Caesar Augustus was a Roman Emperor so when we read in Revelation 17 about how um, the beast that was and is not and yet is this is the Roman Empire that was and then transitioned into the Roman Catholic Church it went from a physical empire to a spiritual empire okay and the the Roman Catholic Church today has reign over the entire world the Vatican City reigns over all the kings of the earth so we see evidence of that today where all the public schools all throughout the world are teaching children indoctrinating children into believing anything but the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and the law of Moses all right, and then of course the they teach uh, <laughs> you know this idea of outer space and UFO aliens and the men on the moon and all that sort of stuff. It, everything contrary to the Word of God. All right, the, the idea of evolution as well. Everything, the beginning, the Big Bang, everything that they teach stems from the Roman Catholic Church. You've heard the phrase "all roads lead to Rome." And so, when the Bible talks about the Antichrist, it's talking about the Pope in Rome. All right, not one specific Pope, but all the Popes. There's never been a good Pope. All right, they've all been wicked sinners and on the fast track to hell. Every single one of them. And there's no call for a Pope in the Bible whatsoever. And there's... 
there's every single possible warning that you could get. Call no man your father upon heaven, for one is your father, that is God. And so you go to, uh, you know, the warnings here in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Um, you know, when he says, uh, If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Uh, the Pope in Rome claims to be the Holy Father, God Almighty. Right? And then we see uh, in, I think it's 2 Thessalonians, isn't it? Uh, where it says, uh, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And he's talking about the Pope. He's already being revealed. So anybody, any denomination, if you will, that teaches that the Pope is not the Antichrist is teaching doctrines that in all likelihood come from the Roman Catholic Church. It's Their whole purpose is to get people away from the idea that the Pope is the Antichrist because if you if you knew it then you wouldn't respect him all right and then of course uh, this is crucial because um, what we read in uh, all throughout the Revelation right about people worshiping the beast well if you understood this in terms of respect and they worshipped the beast. See, you're not going to have respect for the Pope if you know the Pope is the Antichrist. And so what we have today is a, a whole world and a bunch of denominations of people that are not recognizing how wicked the Roman Catholic Church is. Not only does the Pope claim to take the place of Christ, but they're all the doctrines that are coming out of the Roman Catholic Church are wicked. Okay, so no, I, I completely agree with this idea that Rob was talking about here that that they have us surrounded and all these doctrines that go against the belief in Jesus Christ, against the Word of God, all these doctrines are being promoted by the Roman Catholic Church and their goal is to get people away from the truth if you if you do not believe in the truth of Jesus Christ and the and the Word of God then you're gonna naturally put your trust in politicians and that that's true for anybody in any country so you're putting your trust in man and rather than putting your trust in God. And if you're putting your trust in man and you realize that all roads lead to Rome, like we read like we read here in Revelation 17, he reigns over the kings of the earth. The top of the pyramid is the Pope. Alright, so let's say you uh you worship uh you know Donald Trump or Obama, uh, Barack Obama, right? So let's say you you put your trust in those guys. Well, those guys are under the Pope in Rome. So it's a you know you could go all the way down to the local, the local levels. You're putting your trust in your mayor and your governor and your president. Well, all those people, the, the pyramid goes all the way to the top, which is the Pope in Rome. So, anyways, uh, now you're, and we're surrounded. Again, we're surrounded by every imaginable way, at every imaginable angle. Everything in life they've set up against us and against our children so that they won't believe. It's a miracle that anybody is saved in today's world because the, the deception is so great. All right. Edward Chegg, the angels which fell in Genesis 6, uh, the angels which fell in Genesis, did they change the Bible on me? I gotta check this, did they change the Bible? Let's see, the angels that fell, 
Let's find it. Well, oh, it's not there. The angels which fell in Genesis 6. There is no angels in Genesis 6. What are you talking about, Jay? Are chained up. Angels are chained up in Genesis 6. What? You must have a different Bible. Because I'm not seeing it. But the spirit that came out of the kids of angels. What the? What are you talking about? There, there are no angel kids. Angels are not reproductive beings. Angels are spirits. <laughs> yeah, where's this stuff coming from? It's not coming from the Bible. Psalm 104. Who makes his angels spirits. Angels, I could get into this whole thing, but the... Angels don't marry, they don't have sex, they don't have kids. They're not the sons of God. The Bible is very clear on that. Of course, I understand you, this popular doctrine here. I don't know where it comes from, but, but it's not coming from the doc, from the Bible. Uh, came out of the kids of angels and men after the flood are the evil spirit or demons that possess today both animals and humans. You know. Oh my goodness, the book of Enoch, okay. So the book of Enoch belongs in the garbage can. All right, there's no truth to that book at all. Enoch could not have had a book. Enoch lived before the flood. All right, so I better go through this since we're being thorough. Enoch lived before the flood. The flood destroyed everybody but eight people, so Enoch did not survive the flood. All right, and then it was immediately after the flood when God confounded the language and therefore the one language that was spoken before the flood could not be understood after God confounded the language. Anything that was written could not be understood. You know, like we can read, read this here. If God confounded our language right now, this let's say this was the one language and God confounded this language, we would not be able to understand a single thing written here at all. So, uh, anything Enoch would have written would not have been understood. There's no way to understand what he was writing. The only thing that you could do is, uh, is uh, memorize the teaching of what he was you know of what he was teaching you could memorize that it's not like you're it's not like you're gonna forget memory it's just the understanding of that language could not possibly have been understood after God confounded the language if you could still understand that first language and then there, there was a whole nother language you would say to hell with that other new language. I'm sticking with the old language. Guarantee it. Fact is that that first original language was not understood after God confounded the language. Okay, and you think of all the languages spoken today. All those languages are going away too. And Paul makes that very clear. If you were unable to figure it out by then. Whether there be tongues, they shall seize. And then, of course, when Jesus comes, there will be a new language, a pure language, and that we will all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. All right, this is talking about after we are resurrected. So anyways, um, I mean, this is all kinds of just nuts right here. Okay? Not supported by the Bible at all. And it's not surprising that you point to a book outside of the Bible because it, you're not going to find any of this in the Bible. Never heard of Daros? Uh, no. I, am I going to see? I just hope I don't see any dirty pictures here. Daros is the date an employee is expected to return overseas. Daros is commonly referred to as tour of duty. So without the context 
no idea, Ajax. Unless you're referring to something else. I have no idea. I was I never had a tour of duty. I'm on my tour of duty right now. But it, uh, please, I you know. I'm, I'll engage in a conversation, but I, if I don't understand the context, I don't know how I can respond to that. BRL. A while back, I heard of the building of dumps, deep underground military bases. I see that in and on could be simile, similes, but I keep an open mind about things. Okay. That no, there should be no doubt about it in the earth, on the earth, in heaven, uh, you know, it, if you believe in Jesus or you believe on Jesus, it's the same thing, it's not different. If I say he in the bed, we all know that this means that he is under the covers, right, that you're going too far with under the covers, but whatever, sleeping. If I say the book is on the bed, means the book is on top whether you're in the bed whether you're in bed or on the bed it's just a matter it's just a way of speaking it's, it has nothing to do there's not like somebody inside the springs of the bed it means the book on top blankets on the bed clearly seen as one walks into the room I shall do a study on in on earth that sounds rewarding yeah no, it's, a, it's always good to study this stuff, and that's the s sort of thing that I like to do, is you can just go, you can do a whole, just go nuts on this stuff, every time it says in heaven. You see, wow, there's a lot of mentions. Well, go, what are you going to do, watch Showtime movies? This is better than Showtime movies. Right, and there's no on heaven, right? so let's go this way. On Earth, we've got 13 mentions. Read every single mention, and then in Earth, read every single mention. All right. It, it's very re rewarding, no question about it. You can do this too. So nobody's in the moon. Let's see if there's anybody on the moon. No, nope, nobody on the moon. All right. I mean, you could just go nuts with that sort of thing, and and the there's a lot to be gained for sure it's a good way to study earth dry land yeah so what he called the dry land what do you call the dry land let's find out here and the dry land appeared and God called the dry land earth yeah and God so let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so, and God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. All right, Genesis. Now I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this is consistent all throughout the Bible. Uh, what we Like what we read in 1 Thessalonians when... Um, First the dead in Christ shall rise, and then those of us that remain shall be lifted up with them. Uh, we'll be up in heaven with the Lord, and the enemy will be at our feet, and the fire will come down from heaven and destroy our enemy forever. Okay. And so this is consistent when it says, It shall bruise thy head, meaning fire coming down from heaven on top of the serpent's head. And the serpent's head shall bruise his heel, meaning the heel of Jesus, who was stomped down on the all the wickedness of the world. Man, there's nothing about a heel's bruising a head here. I think that's supposed to be E. -E. There's nothing about a heel's bruising a head here. It shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Nothing about a heel's bruising a head. Here, it shall bruise 
thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the imagery here is that he's stomping his heel down on the serpent's head. Now Malachi says this must he must have misspoken here. Okay. Or maybe I don't understand. There is nothing about a heel is bruising a head here. So I think he must have misspoke. Now Malachi says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yeah, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Oreb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. It sound the wicked are already turned to ashes when the people of God step on the earth. Yeah. No. Very interesting. I've wondered if the millennium is now or in the future. Yeah, it's in the it's right now. It's not in the future. It, it's ridiculous to su suggest there's a thousand year period. What's the point? What's the, it's not even the, in the Bible. Uh, what's the point of having a thousand year period? And how in the world does Jesus come back if he's already here after the thousand years? So after the thousand years, we clearly see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven in Revelation 20. If he's already here, how does he come back again? Is there, is there two Jesuses? It doesn't make any sense. And what, there's no point at all of this mystical, magical, thousand-year period after the return of Jesus. Yeah, I, mean, I guess you're, you're, the idea is that you're going to be resurrected in your holy body, and you're going to be pointing your finger at all those that are not in the resurrected body. You're going to, what are you going to guilt them and get your revenge, your, your vengeance on, you know, I'll get those, I'll show these guys. You're going to be like a superhero. You can never die. You can jump off a building, fall flat on your face, and not die. And yet, all these other people that are not saved, that are not in the resurrected body, they can't do what you can do. You're going to be a superhero. See, the whole idea is nonsense. We are in this thousand-year period right now. And it's a unique time period because we have the Spirit of God in us. Uh, and it's for a limited period of time because uh, we are flesh and spirit right now so when Jesus comes the flesh is cut off completely <laughs> right okay uh, so this period of time that we're in right now is not forever it's coming to an end and it's unique to uh, before baby Jesus was born the time period before that is different than the time period that we're in right now. So, uh, no, yeah, and, and again, this Malachi here, this is talking about um, the enemies being under our feet. This, uh, again, goes back to this verse here in Genesis, and then also, like in First Thessalonians 4, what we read, uh, about how first the dead in Christ shall rise, and then those of us which remain shall be lifted up. Uh, this is, uh, again, it's, it's really, it's just saying the same thing over and over again, right? And we'll be caught up together, and when we read this in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, where immediately after the tribulation, right, we are lifted, we are gathered up together, to be with the Lord and then our enemies down below will be destroyed and you know again we could just go 
there's numerous places. It's all talking about the same thing. Alright, and when Satan is loosed, he gathers together the unsaved, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and just devours them all. Alright. So this is all consistent all throughout the Bible. Talking about the same thing, the great day of the Lord. The great day of the Lord. Alright, so a good comment there, I do believe, unless I'm completely misunderstanding that, but I believe you misspoke there. Because this here in Rev in Genesis three is consistent with what you pointed out here in Malachi and all throughout the Bible. So a nice simple breakdown and my brother. Alright, thanks Swampy. Appreciate that. And Richie Jacob says thanks. I guess that's it. So I think I read that last time. I appreciate these comments. Now um I'll continue to respond to these comments, uh, uh, God willing, uh, I enjoy them, and I think it helps to bring clarity, it helps, it might help you, it helps me for sure, so, um, after, yeah, it's after, I mean, come on, doopsie daisy, come on, it's after the, I mean, it, it literally says, the rapture is after the tribulation and again people are confusing wrapped uh, excuse me they're confusing tribulation with the wrath of God it's true we're not going to go through the wrath of God but we are going to go through tribulation and it, you think about what Jesus had to go through and no servant is greater than his master right so also should we expect to suffer hardships in this world for, or I'm sorry right there for then there shall be great tri uh, tribulation and then uh, verse 29 says it plainly says immediately after the tribulation we are raptured up literally says that John 16 these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Uh, I don't know why people obsessively confuse tribulation and wrath. There's no connection to these things whatsoever. Uh, but, of course, you're not going to be able to make a movie, write a book, unless you try to sell this idea that the Great Tribulation is the wrath of God. All right? it, it just doesn't make any sense. You have to willfully ignore the Bible. Except those days be short and there should no flesh be saved. So it's very clear during this Great Tribulation there are going to be people being saved. Alright, and then of course, again, immediately after the tribulation, uh, they shall gather together the elect. Immediately after the tribulation is the rapture. And the rapture is when the Lord comes in the air, and we are lifted up to be with the Lord, and our enemy is at our feet. And fire comes down from heaven, Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Right? I mean, it's consistent all the way throughout the entire Bible. Talking about the great day of the Lord, the end time. It's all the same thing. Alright, very simple. Very easy to understand if you go to like Revel um, Mark 24. The disciples are very curious about this. And they ask him, privately, saying, When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end 
of the world. So when Jesus comes, it is the end of the world. This curiosity is nothing new. It's always been there. We've always wondered what is going to come at the end of the world. And that is laid out for us very simply, very clearly, that Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are those of us that are saved are gathered up to be with the Lord and our enemy is at our feet and isn't it interesting here in Revelation 1 behold he cometh with clouds and he's coming and when he comes that's going to be it it's the end of the world those of us and this is the separation from the wheat and the tares right the wheat and the false wheat the wheat will be lifted up and the false wheat down below will be burned okay so anyways appreciate the comments and everything else have a good day